thankful that my name was written down in heaven many years ago. Glad to be saved by the grace of God. Good to see you tonight on a Sunday night. Glad you're here in the house of the Lord. Appreciate you being in the service. I trust God will richly bless you being with us tonight. If you're visiting, we're glad to have you tonight. And a special message tonight as we uh, honor those and recognize those that are uh, graduating our church. And we have quite a few uh, that you'll see a little later tonight. And uh, we recognize them a little bit. And then also, I uh, want to mention to you as well uh, that if you're visiting and you're not with someone, uh, that's um, here because of that. We're still glad you're here as well. Thank you for being with us. I uh, do want you to be much in prayer for several of our church that are away tonight in ministry. Uh, I want you to be praying for the uh, Cranfords. Uh, they are uh, in a meeting tonight. Brother Dalton and Miss Casey presenting their work for Ireland. I want you to be much in prayer for them if you would. Then also, I want you to be much in prayer for Brother Charlie Russell. You know what I miss him, Brother Russell and Sister Russell up in um, Lenore, and uh, they're up there tonight. Um, I think he's doing a mission Sunday for them, and he's preaching up there. As you know, Brother Russell's from, uh, out of Calvary here uh, with Rock of Ages, and the chaplain up in uh, Tennessee. So do be much in prayer for them. Uh, also tonight, uh, I want you to be much in prayer uh, if you will for Brother Scott. Uh, Brother Scott's another young man in our church. He and his wife, Miss Heaven, they just joined church a few weeks ago, and uh, he is speaking tonight at a youth service. Uh, down in the Morrisville area. So be much in prayer for him and ask the Lord to uh, touch him and God give him good services. Aren't you thankful that we have men out of here every morning preaching the Word of God? Thankful for that and glad of it. And I appreciate the Lord and His blessings. Let's go to God in prayer. Again, let me mention before we pray, I do want to ask you a member to pray for the family of Todd Folkman. I mentioned Brother Todd this morning. He was the music director for me when I was in Burlington. Out of the 13 years I was there, probably about eight, I guess, in the States, eight, nine of those years, Brother Todd was with me. Uh, Brother Todd, I think it's in his mid to late 40s, but uh, just a few days ago, on his way home from work, a mile from his house, for some reason, car veered off the road, he went into a tree head on and lost his life. And a um, very difficult thing as a 17 year old son graduating high school next Tuesday, and then. 14-year-old uh, daughter at home and his wife, and I uh, just want to say that I appreciate you remember that family. Uh, they are going through a very difficult time. When I know the arrangements, I'll be going down over to the visitation. And uh, but uh, Brother Todd's a good fellow, love the Lord, a good family, and uh, his his kids are going to miss him. His son uh, is a motocross racer. Actually, was getting ready to try to qualify for Loretta Lynn's national. This year, his dad's been with him ever since he was about three years old, every step of the way as he come through this motocross deal. And now he's 17 years old, his dad's not going to be there. So, uh, got to be difficult for this family. And so you remember much of prayer for the Fogelman family, if you would, ask the Lord to touch them, and I would appreciate that greatly. And pray for us. I'll tell you, the last two or three times I've had to go to Burlington, it's been because of families who've had deaths. Miss Betsy in her 50s had those two strokes. And so, uh, you know, you don't have to be 80, 90 years old to pass away. Uh, just in a moment, everything can change. And I'll say this to you tonight, the most important thing is if it does, that you are ready. You are ready. And so I'm glad uh, that these two were. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. It's good to have some in this church. I'm going to up here with us tonight. And uh, what I say, when is Tardis tonight? When is Tardis? Would that be close? All right. Good. And uh, you know I'm not going to go much farther than that and talk to her or something. <laughs> I'm going to learn it though. Would you teach me Spanish? Would you do that really? Just words. I don't want, I'm not even good at grammar in English. So don't worry about that. Just words. So I like to talk to them. I'm going to go preach about one day all in Spanish. About a two minute message. <laughs> all, right. all right. Anyway, it is good to see you tonight in the house of God. Let's go ahead and pray. Ask the Lord to be with us. Brother Bucket, make your way up. It's good to have you up in the service with us. They're not up here much in this service. They're usually over in our Spanish church building. But it's good to have him up here with us. And uh, if you want to pray in Spanish, it'll be all right. Just pray to God anyway. Right? right? Since they're in here, might be good to do that. Okay? Señor, muchísimas gracias por este día, la oportunidad que nos has dado para congregarnos aquí en este lugar. Qué privilegio, Señor. Te pido que todos salgan conforme tu voluntad perfecta, buena y agradable. Y gracias, Señor, por la salvación que tenemos en Jesucristo. Es un placer, Señor, servirte aquí en este lugar. 
Te pido, Señor, que bendices, por favor, todos los ministerios que tenemos aquí en la Iglesia Bautista Calvario, Calvary Baptist Church. Y te pido, Señor, que podamos ver la salvación de mucha gente más. Y, Señor, que podamos aprovecharnos, Señor, de tu palabra, predicar nosotros esta tarde. Gracias por todo. Te pido estas cosas en el nombre de Jesucristo y con acción de gracias. Amén. All right, you can be seated. Enjoy the choir. Didn't they do a great job this morning? Oh, I'll tell you what, I enjoyed the choir this morning. Told my wife, don't get to hear any better choir singing we heard this morning. And we're looking forward to hearing uh, tonight. So you pray for it. So I trust you'll uh, give me your attention to them. Thank you very much. 
Well, it's good to be with you guys. Nehemiah chapter 1, I'm going to read you a verse here, uh, just for sake of time. Verse 4 says, And it came to pass, when I heard these words, Nehemiah says, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. You know, Nehemiah was a cupbearer. He had a pretty good job. He was a cupbearer in a place called Shushan the Palace, uh, and that's in modern-day Iran in the southeast, about uh, a long ways away from Jerusalem, and his life was pretty good. He got to eat and drink everything the king did. That's pretty good food, right? And everything was good as long as no one tried to poison the king. And uh, once that happened, the job was not such a good job. But boy, if it never happened, that guy got to eat the best of the best food. Things were great. He lived in the palace. And one question was brought forth, and that question changed his life. And this is the question. How is Jerusalem? What's going on in Jerusalem? See, the truth of the matter, Nehemiah was uh, relatively a young man, and he was born most likely and raised in captivity. Jerusalem was not home. It was not somewhere he had lived for 50 or 60 years and was taken away from and he was missing home. It was somewhere totally different. It was somewhere that wasn't home. But his heart burned. And when he found out that things were not good, it changed his life. And what's so interesting here is it says he, when he heard it, he broke down and he wept and he mourned and he prayed to, I love this, you know, he prayed to, he prayed to God, but he didn't just say it was God. He said the God of heaven. He had an extremely high view of who God was. I want to tell you my story. I was raised not really going to church very much. At 15 years old, I believed on Jesus Christ as my Savior. When I heard a Muslim man get up at a youth retreat I did not want to be at that I was tricked into going to, and he gave his testimony about how someone loved Jesus enough to give him the gospel, and he got saved. And I knew one thing that night. That guy had something I didn't have. And I believed on Jesus Christ as my Savior. I started going to the Victory Baptist Church in Loganville, Georgia. And I'm trained by my pastor. That's what I am. I'm a product of my church. My pastor, Derek Lawrence, loved on me. And I didn't come to church with a Bible under my hand and said, I'm going to be a missionary. That didn't matter to him. That didn't matter at all to him. He just loved me and trained me and taught me and showed me the Bible. And every time my pastor preached out of this book, God spoke to my heart. I don't know anything about the Bible. But when he preached out of it, man, God got a hold of me. Boy, before long, I felt like God was calling me to preach. I went to my pastor and told him, he said, we're going to send you off to Bible college. I went off to Bible college and came back, and I didn't know much more. I had a degree, but I didn't know what I was doing, and for some reason, my pastor put me on staff. And that's where I learned how to do ministry. That man taught me how to love. He taught me how to forgive. You know how to forgive? Because we're forgiven. And he showed me that. He showed me how to do funerals and weddings. And I remember my first wedding, I was scared to death. I, uh, I didn't know what I was doing, and, and my pastor wasn't going to be there, and he told me, I'm going to give you my notes. And uh, I got his notes, and I read through them, and, and the wedding was going, the procession was going on, and the bride came down, and I said, they're all standing, and everybody stood. And I was so nervous, I forgot to tell people to sit back down. And for the whole wedding, people did this. The wedding, sit down, you think somebody would have sat down, no one did. I thought, man, I messed up. I went to my pastor and told him about it. He said, don't worry about that. That's the kind of pastor I have. He could have said, you know, if you can't get people to sit down, you probably not need to be in the ministry. He didn't do that. He loved on me and he trained me and showed me how to do ministry. Now, I told you Nehemiah's life changed when he heard the result of one question. You know, a common misconception in churches today is that the job and task of world evangelism belongs to the missionary. God didn't call me to China, so it's not my problem. But I can tell you the problem is it's not found in the Bible. The job and task and obligation of New Testament missions, of getting the gospel to every soul, is the job of the Christian. If I may say, it's the job of the church, which is nothing more than made up of Christians. It's our job. And once I realized that and learned that, my heart was burdened for world mission, missions. In Argentina, 35 people die every hour. According to Operation World, only 9% of the population believes on Jesus Christ for faith and salvation. Over 91% of the people are dying and they're going to go to hell. Not because, for the majority of them, not because they rejected Christ, but for the majority of them because they never one time heard a great presentation of the gospel. 
We've been on meditation a year and two months, and we've seen God do great things. It's been exciting. We've seen church after church after church. It's been so good to us. We said one of my favorite things to see. You know, we're out trying to raise support, and God's been good. But one of my favorite things to see is when we see a young man get up stirred after church and say, boy, God's dealing with me about doing something for him. I want to do something. That's my favorite thing to see. It's been great. God's been good. Can I tell you something? During this year, we've seen all these things happen a year and two months. During this year, over 314,000 people have died in Argentina. Never having a church like this. I ask you to pray for us, pray for our family. We're leaving March 24th of next year, 2016. We're heading out, and we're going to see God do great things. Be praying for us, be praying for Argentina. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate you. I love, I tell people this all the time, I love supporting missionaries that are preachers. And I appreciate him. Good to have him with us tonight in the service and I thank you for being here and we'll sort of pray about this and talk with him uh, more maybe this evening. Uh, what we want to do right now during the service, uh, Brother James, get a microphone. They will love you to be up here in a second. If you would. Um, and just hold on to it. You can have a seat. I'll get you to use it here in just a minute. We're going to go ahead tonight and you are more than welcome if you want to take pictures or whatever you want to do that tonight. But we want to go ahead tonight and recognize two young people that uh, graduated through homeschool that are um, here in our church. And um, we're going to go ahead and do both of those tonight and give them the diplomas um, tonight. Uh, it, it's an awesome thing to uh, graduate from anything, but it's especially awesome to graduate and know that you're saved and that you're going to serve the Lord and that God's going to use you your life. And I trust these young people might realize that and that they know that. Uh, the first uh, certificate, and this is by my order, just the way the land on the pulpit that I want to give tonight is Victory Lane Christian School. Uh, this certifies that Lauren, and I didn't know this, Danielle Ross, I did not realize her name is Danielle has successfully completed the required course of study approved by the Non-Public Board of Education for the state of North Carolina and therefore awarded this diploma given this 7th day of June 2015. Uh, the Chief Administrator is Brother Stacy Robinson and the teacher is Miss Carol Robinson. And so this is for their homeschool. So uh, Miss Lord, can you come up? God bless you. Amen. All right, the second one we're going to do is a diploma graduation. This is Lighthouse Academy, Statesville, North Carolina. This certifies that Linda Renee Severs has completed a course of study prescribed for graduation. And this institution is therefore awarded this high school diploma and is entitled to all the rights and privileges. Uh, appertaining there unto. Given this seventh day of June 2015, administrator is Mr. Robin Sellers and the pastor is Dr. Chris Hazel. So uh, you come on up if you wish to know and receive this. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Amen. I appreciate these young people. And uh, now, uh, I want to do this. Brother James, you take the light, go down. We'll start with Brother Josh. When he comes to you, Brother Josh, just stand up and tell the church tonight uh, what, what you're graduating from. And then just hand it to the next person. Tell them your name. That's right. Why do you know Stand up and do that if you will. My name is Josh Edge. I went to uh, NASCAR Technical Institute in North Carolina. Just a uh, career change. Automotive technologies. Basically something you have to feed Thank you guys for recognizing me. Well, the rest of us have been people that I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Also, the United States Marines. <laughs> okay. My name is Jay Barnett, and uh, I'm graduating from South Iron High School. And uh, my future is in the Marine Corps. But at first, I do want to thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Is also 
facilities, no graduate of South Dakota High School, no going to be an electrical engineer.
your Bible tonight and turn with me to a very familiar passage of the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter number 4 tonight. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. And I just want to read a couple of verses here uh, that are very familiar. But I think this applies very well to those that are graduating high school, graduating college, or whatever that might be. Let's stand together. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 6. 2 Timothy 4, verse number 6. Paul said, For I am now ready to be offered. Now I want you to understand something tonight, and I, I think it's important tonight that I share this with you. The Apostle Paul had run a very good race. Somebody say amen tonight. And because of that, he could say these words. So I want you to listen again. Paul said, For I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I couldn't help to grin a little bit when I was working on this. I think of these young people. Here's your departure. For most of you, high school's done. Comes the next part. For some of you going somewhere, your parents are smiling about your departure. For others, maybe not so. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I want to preach for a moment tonight on what do I do now? What do I do now? All right, I got a high school diploma. My brother Josh knows what he's going to do. He's going to take care of all the kids he's got. But what, what, what do I do now with my life? What's next? Well, tonight I want to speak to you just a couple of minutes on that. But before I do, I've got a top ten list. Like David Letterman did. We're going to start from the ten and go down to one. And uh, the top ten list is going to be ten things you didn't learn in high school or college. And I'm going to give them to you here in just a minute. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'll bless these young people tonight. Thank you, Lord, for their hard work through these 12 years, some more that you have allowed them to learn, to grow. Lord, I thank you, Father, tonight. Now, Lord, we have them going out, some further education, as Brother Josh, Lord, taking care of his family and helping in his life. And Lord, I realize tonight, Father, that God, they have big decisions ahead of them. Lord, as far as I know, each one of these young people have given their life to Christ, what I know through personal testimony. Lord, that's the greatest decision anyone could have ever made. Lord, I'm glad of that. But Lord, I pray tonight, now, Father, you just go with them, guide and direct them in their journey. And Lord, tonight, I pray, Father, that you would help them to be great ambassadors for Christ, no matter where they go in their life. We'll thank you for all that you do, for we ask it in Christ's name, and all God's people say it. You can be seated tonight. I want to start tonight at number 10. And we'll go down and go down to the number one thing tonight. On 10 things you did not learn in high school or college. Number 10. This applies to the high school students. You will most likely not make $40,000 a year right out of high school. Life lesson. Make sure you're worth what you do to get paid. Number nine, life is not divided into semesters. You don't get the summer off. Yeah. Number eight, life's not fair. Get used to it. Life lesson, life is hard, but God is good. Number seven, your school may have done away with winners and losers, but life is not. Life lesson. Grades given in life are worth more than grades given in school. Number six. Be nice to nerds. Chances are you end up working for one. <laughs> Number five. If you think your teacher is tough, wait till you get a boss. Life lesson. The boss is always right. Number four, and one of the best, television is not reality. Number three, 
People expect you to accomplish something before you feel good about it. Life lesson. Weapons are going to happen through life. Number two. If you mess up, it's not your parents' fault. Responsibility is vital. Take it for yourself. And number one, and I actually do really like this, dependability is paid by more responsibility. Life lesson is rewards and raises are given to finishers, not starters. Whatever you're going to do, do all to the glory of God. I do want to say this, I want to encourage every one of you that are graduating high school. Brother Josh, I think this is very applicable for you as well. I want to say this to you that most people may not remember your start of college or your start of that new job or the Marine Corps or whatever you may do with your life as a mom or as a, uh, some other ambition. But they may watch you and see how well you finish. And I will encourage you, whatever you do, it will be great if every one of the young men in our church were called to preach or called to the mission field. But I understand that not every one of them, that would be the case. But I do want to say this, whatsoever you do, you can bring God the glory. Whatever part of your life you live in, you can do something good for God and you can make a difference for the Lord. I'm going to give you three R's of education. Or three R's of a godly graduate. What do I do now. Three things I'm going to mention. First of all, you need to be ready. You need to be ready. Abraham Lincoln said this statement, I think the necessity of being ready has increased. He even made that in his day. Can I say this? We live in a world today now where you must prepare yourself for the future. I do believe we are to prepare ourselves and be ready for whatever God has for us in our lives. I be one of the greatest ways you can be ready to learn to know the Word of God. I be one of the greatest ways you can be ready is to have a relationship with Christ. I be one of the greatest ways that you can be ready is to make sure your spiritual life is ready and then you take the next steps in your life to prepare you for whatever God would have you do. Just like as our Brother Henry said tonight, as a missionary here uh, tonight, he said his pastor put him in the Word. His pastor said go to college, learn the Word of God, and apply that to your life. And can I say this? I mean, it's important that we're ready no matter what we go into. When I got saved, I was up. I, 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 one week later, I was called to preach. After that week when I was called to preach, my pastor of that time of convention church, not a fundamental independent Baptist church like here tonight, but more, uh, uh, more I guess, uh, 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 I don't know what you call it that day because it wouldn't have been called the team break if it weren't. But anyway, a convention church sent me to one of their colleges. When I got to their college, it was unbelievable. They denied the Word of God. They had no standards. The college was totally different. After I got saved, and what I tell you what, the only reason God sent me there was that I met Miss Wendy. And uh, God knew she was there. God knew for 31 years she'd be a pastor's wife and hopefully for several more before I conk out. But anyway, for 31 years. But God began permanently later. I came home, went to Bible college. And then, of course, I was able uh, in my life to become a pastor and to do what I did. But I started really young and I was not ready. I started pastoring my first church when I was 20. God bless those people's hearts. And I just want to say this. I'm thankful through gray hair and a little older that I've learned some lessons through life. One of them is to be ready. I found this great illustration. I think all of you will like it. A newly appointed young preacher was contacted by the local field director to hold a graveside committal service at a small country cemetery in Iowa. There was to be no funeral, just a committal, because sadly, the deceased had no family or friends left in Iowa. The young pastor started early to the cemetery, but lost his way on the long back roads. After backtracking many miles, he finally arrived a half hour late. The hearse was nowhere in sight, and the workmen were relaxing under a nearby tree, eating their lunch. The pastor went to the 
open grave and found that the vault lid was already in place. He took out his book and read the service. As he returned to his car, one of the workmen paused between bites and said, Think we should have told him that's a septic tank? <laughs> Be ready. Know the difference between a septic tank and grave. What I'm saying is in your life, you must be ready. Paul said that he was ready to be offered. Paul's life was ready. And we must be ready in our life for whatever God has. Listen, I shouldn't walk in the pulpit and not be ready to preach. This missionary should not come tonight and not be ready to present his word. You should not sing in the choir and not be ready. Life is full of being ready to do what God wants you to do. One thing I love about Brother James, he don't want a choir. Listen, it's like pulling teeth to get him into a soul with a choir if he don't think the choir is ready. Why? Because if you're doing something, you ought to do your best for God. You ought to be ready in what you do. You ought to be prepared for what you do in life. Let me say this to every one of our graduates, but to every one of us as well. Make sure in life that you're ready. One of the R's of being a godly graduate is being ready. Be ready. Prepare yourself. And I'll say something to every one of you. Reading and writing and arithmetic, all that's wonderful stuff. Going to college and getting a degree and whatever it is, that's a good thing. If you don't go to college and get a job, that's still a good thing. But what I'm saying to you is this. Make sure you're spiritually ready for life. Because I'm going to tell you this, some of you don't realize how guarded you have been. Some of you know that, you know, you say, well, I'm telling you the truth. I, 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 I'm tired. Of, boy, I'm getting ready to go to school. And, and I'm here, Jacob, now. Hallelujah, I'm going to Marine Corps. I'm tired of anybody telling me what to do. Bad news, man. <laughs> but maybe tonight, someone will say, i got to go face some things that I need to be ready for. Let me say this tonight. You need to make sure you're ready, ready for life. Best way to be ready for life is to simply, I believe, make sure in your life that you are preparing yourself for whatever comes. Second of all, I believe you need, I like what Paul said, I fought a good fight. You need to be resolved. What I mean by that? What matters most is not how you begin the race, but how you finish it. What the difference between being involved and being resolved? Let me give you this, bacon and eggs. I just went across the illustration. I liked it. For the chicken, it says, that's being involved. For the pig, it's bacon. That's being resolved. What matters most is not how you begin the race, but how you finish it. No one ever remembers the score of a game at the end of the first quarter. It's the score of the end of the game that matters. Let me say this to you. In 31 years of ministry, and last week I had a lady write a three-page letter to me to church I was in and gave it to my wife. Up when her whole life was just about to go under. And I was preaching in a house in Hilltop Baptist Church in Lexington. And her family was there and everything was about to go under. And God touched in that service that night. And God rescued their family. And she wrote me a three-page letter to let me know, Preacher, just in case you're wondering, I want you to know your ministry is making a difference. And my family's together. And God has touched our family very much. So much ago, I was preaching in a meeting down in uh, Burlington, North Carolina, when a lady came, I shared with you, with her children, that was a 17-year-old girl, and she was, well, she was uh, with child, she was pregnant with child, the first time I met her, I'd never seen her, she'd never seen me, and I preached the gospel to her, and at 17 years old, in that service that night, she gave her life to Christ, and she came to hear me preach as a mother now, four kids, and one in college. And she came a few weeks ago to say to me, Preacher, I know you don't know me. You probably don't remember me. But I was 17 years old when I first met you. And you told me Jesus loved me and my life was not over. And you shared with me the gospel. And I got saved. She said, I want you to know now that my children are saved, that I'm saved, that my husband's saved. And we're serving God in church. And I saw your name. And I just wanted you to know. I, 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 so I came to the meeting so I could tell you that that I'm doing well serving God. See, preacher, why is that so important? Because all of those good things, if I were to blow it next week, you would never remember. Because the first quarter might have ended. But the game's not over. 
What I'm saying is, Paul said he was resolved. You know what it means to be resolved? Paul said, I fought a good fight. I made up my mind that it is worth it serving God. I made up my mind if I'm going to do it, I'm going to give 100% to it, and I'm going to do it the best of my ability. My daughter will tell you, I drive and drive and drive and drive into her. If you're going to do it, you do it. And I'm glad she has, but you do it with all you've got. I've always told Danielle, and, and I'm glad she's doing much better in the education part. She has a golf party, and her something school's going to give her a uh, graduate assistant job in the college teaching golf, and she'll get a master's, and I'm thankful for all of that. But I want you to listen, and I want you to understand this. I told her about her golf team. I said, listen, I've heard girls from wow. I've been, I've been watching college golf. This will be my fourth year. Thank God my last year. And I've been watching, I've been watching, and they whine on the golf course. I just can't hit it straight. Everybody's mad at me. But you know how they act in practice? They'd rather be with a boyfriend. Or they'd rather be going to eat. Instead of out there in 100 degrees sweating on a putt green. Or hitting, you know why? Because they're not resolved to be any better. They just want to whine about when they're not any good. And can I tell you that applies to life? Can I tell you tonight, it really applies to life. If you want to be something, then be something. If you want to do something, be resolved in your life to be the best at whatever you do. Can I say this to you guys tonight? I don't know what you're going to do. But I will say this to you. You ought to put your heart in it. And you ought to be the best at it. And you ought to give it. Listen, if somebody's paying for your college, you ought to realize that they're sacrificing. You ought to be your best. You ought to be your best. If it's going to be for God, be your best. we got young men in this church right now in our Bible college. Brother Randy here uh, uh, in college trying really, wanting to preach is his heart's desire. You think about young men throughout this church that are called to preach. Brother Alex here and Brother John and others. And we have the Bible college. Listen, if you're going to stay, listen, if you say, I'm called to preach, then study the Word of God. Right. And get it in your heart. And I want you to understand without any reservation that you need to be resolved in whatever you do. We need to be first of all ready for life. Second of all, we need to be resolved. Third of all, there's a reward involved. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 26, what shall a man, what shall a man profit a man, what shall a profit a man that have gained the whole world lose, yet lose his soul? I read this story, and since Brother James up here is in the county, Daniel's boyfriend Max in the county, and I thought this would be a good little story. The story is told in which in the county nature never ties before a top job with a large firm. At the end of the interview, the chairman asked, can you imagine a young man's nervous, one last question after all these tough CPA questions. He said, what is three times seven? The accountant thought for a minute and replied, 22. Outside, he checked himself on his calculator and concluded he had lost the job. But two weeks later, he was offered the post. He asked the chairman why he had been appointed when he had given the wrong answer. The chairman replied, you were the closest. <laughs> Some people have the mistaken idea that God is like the man who conducted the interview. They think it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're close to the truth. But that's not true. If you're going to be rewarded in your life, being close is not enough. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, being close is not enough. If you're here tonight and you say, I want to sell out for God, then being close to that is not enough. You have to be willing to say, I'm going all in. I'm going all in. Can I say this to you tonight? And I believe this with all my heart. One of the most exciting times of life is when you leave those high school years and you begin to decide, what am I going to do with this mess I call my life? What am I going to do with it? And I want to say to every one of these graduating seniors in high school, and I want to say this to every one of us in the building that a long time ago got out of school, to God be the Lord. And if anybody ever says to you, Oh, you're going to miss school. It was the greatest years of your life. I'm not going to ever say that. I hated school. I still hate it. I didn't want to go to school. I didn't like school. I didn't like teachers. I didn't like any of it. And it has not changed since I was 18. 
I just went to school first. I'll say that, but you well, I was could lie, but it's just the truth. I just, oh, you don't miss it to get out. I have not missed it. I have. Now some people do. My wife will go back to school now. True. She likes it. Stuff like that. Love it. Well, they gave me my diploma. I'm not sure if I got it. Only if they just said, here, do the best you can. <laughs> but I will say this to you guys tonight, all the children aside. This is the first day of the rest of your life. Rewards are coming if you'll be faithful. If you'll just stay faithful in your resolve, I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to do the best I can. I don't care what theory says. I'm going to do the best I can. You're going to make up your mind. Jacob, you go to Marine Corps, don't want to be a Marine Corps to be the best of the But go in most of all to be the best Christian. Because see, the deal is, you're getting ready to face stuff you think you've heard it all you have. There's going to be guys in there, the son of Marine Corps, that come in, whose lives are shambles. And their only hope could be you. That's bigger than being great Marine. That's being a great Christian. For you girls, for you need more teeth, I'm telling you, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And if you can't do it to the glory of God, then do it. I will say all of you tonight, life goes by quickly. I was laughing at Miss Martin this morning. She was about to tell me she's 15 today. Woo! I said, man, sweet 16 is coming. You know, these kids love me. I'm going to be 16. I'm going to be 18. I'm going to be 21. How old But here's the deal. Later on down the road, we're going to look back and say, man, I like you. Enjoy what God's given you. You're not promised another day. It goes by very fast. I'm telling you, I looked in the mirror one day on 51. I'm like, why, man? I remember when I thought people 51 went home. <laughs> Somebody told me the other day, said, oh, don't worry about it. 50 is the new 40. I thought they knew that every year. I'll be 100 one day the new 90. You know what I'm saying? Forget it, man. Stuff still gets to cracking and popping and this thing, you know. My mind is still about 22. I still ride a dirt bike back for 22. When I fall now, I used to bounce. Now when I fall on the dirt bike, I just like hit the ground and don't move. <laughs> My mind says, you can do it. My body says, don't do it. <laughs> get to the place in life when you get old enough and you do something good, people say, man, that's great for your age. <laughs> but if you do it bad, they say, well, they got to expect that because you're your age. So either way, man, I'm a winner. Either way. Guys, I want to tell you tonight that I love you. And I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you that you finished school. I'm proud of you that you... Brother Josh, see more you. You want to make something yourself for your family. I'm proud of you guys that you want to live for God and serve God. But I'll say something to you. Life without Christ is a mess. Keep Him first. Here's what I like to do tonight. I like for every one of those that are graduates tonight, let's all stand together. Everyone that are graduates tonight here, I would like for them to come, and we've got plenty of space around here, and I want to kneel at the altar, but I want their family to come and kneel around them tonight, if you would. If you, each one of you graduates just come, you have family here tonight, just, you know, guys, if y'all want to come to my left over here, you can move now, and girls to my right, and I want their family just to kneel around them for just a moment, and we're going to pray. We're going to ask God to touch them the next step of their life. If you're visiting tonight with them and friends, family, whoever you might be, you'd like to come pray.
for it, so if you're welcome to tonight. Wonderful. It's good to see everybody tonight here. We'll see about you. We're going to pray for these young people. Let's bow together. Father, we're indeed thankful tonight. We've had this opportunity, Lord, to be able to come together in God's house. Lord, we're very thankful tonight, Lord, for men and women that you're calling to preach the gospel. Missionaries that you call them, as we heard tonight. Lord, we pray and plead the blood tonight over of the immigrant family. That God, you would use them greatly in the country of Argentina. God, in these last months of deputation, that you would keep them safe. Watch over the family. Give them their heart's desire and bury their heart in Argentina for the people there. Lord, I pray, Father, tonight for those young men that have been called to preach and are studying in this church. Lord, I also thank you tonight for the United States Marine Corps that Jacob will be going into. And I thank you tonight for these young ladies and men that will be going in other directions in their life. And Lord, we pray that God, you would guide them and direct them. And that, Lord, when they're away from their family, when they're out out from underneath those bars of love. And God, you would grant them safety and peace. But most of all, they would be a great shining testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you so much tonight for these young people. Many of them I've seen walk this aisle give their life to Christ. Some of them I've been their pastor for these whole 13 years that I've been encountering. Lord, I'm very thankful for that. God, go with these families and bless them. Bless these young people. Lord, raise up a generation that knows Christ and is not ashamed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.